Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to talk about a Supreme Court decision that came out this morning that I think honestly is a real mess. And I think there are reasons for it being a mess really from both sides of the political, judicial, and legal spectrum. And so instead of doing this, like we did Google versus Oracle, like we did some other really big cases last year, like Bose Stock, we're not going to do slides. We're not going to do different evidentiary things or arguments. We're not going to make this a 45 minute long video. Instead, we're going to talk about the principles here, why I think they were arrived at. We're going to talk, of course, about the actual language used by the court. But first, we're going to start off with a story. On your screen in front of you is a police patrol car. In this patrol car is a database search engine, a computer that allows the officers that have access to that car to go and search for things. When they pull someone over, they go and search for a license plate, see if there are any outstanding warrants, maybe search for addresses or other things that will help them in their policing duties. And as part of their ability to access that computer, they have agreed to abide by certain police principles, whatever those policies might be, one of which is that the police officers in this patrol car are not allowed to do things with that database, with that search feature, that are only for personal use. They aren't allowed to just go and search their ex-girlfriend on Facebook, wherever it might be, with the police database, because obviously that's an invasion of privacy. And I think we could probably all agree that's, that's not a great thing. So now further imagine that the police officer that has this patrol car gets approached by an individual that says, hey, look, I met this woman in a strip club And I'd like to make sure she's not an undercover officer because I want to meet her and do other things with her around the bend. And could you please search for her license information and make sure that she's not a police officer? If you do, Mr. Officer, I will give you $5,000. And this police officer in the patrol car says, okay, I'll take the $5,000. Does the search for this individual in violation of the policies of his department, gives over the information, and then is arrested because it was actually a sting by the Federal Bureau of Investigation who winds up suing them in federal court in the case that we're about to talk about today. Now, before we get into the legalese here, because we're going to talk about statutes, we're going to talk about things that are very, very reliant on parsing language very, very closely, and a lot of parsing here I disagree with pretty vehemently, in all honesty. What would you say about that state of affairs? Is this the kind of thing that should be illegal? Is it the kind of thing that you think is illegal, a police officer going in, accepting $5,000 for searching a database for a license plate for someone that says he wants more information on a woman he met in a strip club. I think we could probably all agree that we think it's illegal. We think it probably should be illegal. As we say in virtual legality, that doesn't make it illegal. What is right is not always legal. Also goes along with what is wrong is not always illegal. And so we have to parse the statute pretty closely. But I think most people think that there are problems here, which leads us to the Supreme Court case of Van Buren versus the United States. As described here, former Georgia Police Sergeant Nathan Van Buren used his patrol car computer to access a law enforcement database to retrieve information about a particular license plate number in exchange for money. Although Van Buren used his own valid credentials to perform the search, his conduct violated a department policy against obtaining database information for non-law enforcement purposes. Unbeknownst to Van Buren, his actions were part of a Federal Bureau of Investigation sting operation. And so what did that sting ultimately wind up suing him for? Well, under 18 U.S.C. 1030, it was fraud and related activity in connection with computers. Whoever intentionally accesses a computer without authorization, which is not what happened here, or exceeds authorized access, and that's where all the rubber is going to hit the road on this today, and thereby obtains information from any protected computer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, shall be punished. So if you go and you exceed your authorized access and obtain information from any protected computer, then you are going to be in trouble with this law. You're a federal criminal and you can have a case brought against you. Now, as you could probably tell, if you've been in virtual reality for a while, there are a number of definitions that pop up there that are pretty important to this. We'll get back to computer in just a second. One of them is this protected computer concept, right? You see, okay, it's a federal law. What 
federal law did this local sergeant actually violate? We want to be careful that we're in the jurisdiction of the U.S. federal government. And they do it by saying a protected computer means a computer that has moved in or otherwise affects interstate or foreign commerce. Now, you might not think that the patrol car computer that doesn't really exceed its mandate or its jurisdiction actually affects interstate or foreign commerce, but... If you've watched our video on Wickard versus Filborn, or if you're just familiar with U.S. jurisprudence in general, you know that anything that touches the internet is in fact something that is under federal purview by virtue of decisions like this one at the Supreme Court level. And we will see that referenced as part of this particular case. That's protected computer. That isn't nearly as important as what this statute means by exceeds authorized access. You might think you know what it means. You might have noted, especially if you're familiar with virtual legality, that those words weren't capitalized. You might not even think you have to check the definitions. And yet the definitions actually put a term definition on the phrase exceeds authorized access to mean to access a computer with authorization and to use such access to obtain or alter information in the computer that the accessor is not entitled so to obtain or alter. And if you don't think that's great congressional legislative writing, I cannot disagree with you. There's a lot there that is unexplained. That's a reason why there is a circuit split that different courts of the United States have read this to be different. That's why the Supreme Court took up the case was to settle that split. And yet there's a whole lot here that we're going to see is basically ignored even in that definition. So so let's look at what is actually decided. We're going to skip the syllabus here. We're going to go on to talk about that internet computer. Initially, subsection A2's prohibition barred accessing only certain financial information. It has since expanded to cover any information from any computer used in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce or communication. And as a result, the prohibition now applies at a minimum to all information from all computers that connect to the internet. Do you think that's a little broad for congressional authority on the Constitution? You might be right. That's not up to me. It's not up to you. Unfortunately, it's up to these nine individuals here. And they've said everything that touches the internet, the Congress of the United States can regulate, can prohibit, can make federal criminals out of. And so we get into this particular case. Now, we get all of Van Buren's background here. We talked about it. We talked about the FBI sting operation. And now we talk about the court's decision. First, they say Van Buren and the government raise a host of policy arguments to support their respective interpretations, as we've talked about in virtual legality, and which will come up again here as part of this video. That's not supposed to be all that important to the court system or the Supreme Court. Policy is handled by the legislature and to some extent through veto powers and otherwise by the executive. The courts are supposed to interpret the laws that are put in front of them and say what they do, what they don't do, and whether or not they violate things like the Constitution. Here, the court properly says, well, they raise a lot of policy arguments, but we start our analysis where we always do with the text of the statute. The parties agree that Van Buren accessed a computer with authorization when he used his patrol car computer and valid credentials to log into the law enforcement database. They also agree that Van Buren obtained information in the computer when he acquired the license plate record for Albo. That's the individual that asked him to go get it for $5,000. The dispute is whether Van Buren was entitled so to obtain the record. And yes, entitled so to obtain or alter is a mouthful, and it winds up with these justices, very, very smart people all, fighting over entitled, fighting over so, fighting over obtain, fighting over access in this 40-page long document that really isn't all that illuminating for folks that are trying to find that illumination. And we'll talk about why it's a mess, as I described in the thumbnail, as we go through this thinking. But you'll note what was agreed to and what wasn't, right? They say the parties agreed that the computer was accessed with authorization, computer with authorization. We know that. They agree that information in the computer was obtained. We got this part here to obtain or alter information in the computer. We don't talk about to use such access, uh, and that's going to be important because what the court's ultimately going to determine would appear to eviscerate this phrase from the statute. That's not actually discussed by either the opinion makers, the majority, or the dissent. We're only going to bring it up in this video because, hey, we don't sit on the Supreme Court, and the fight is going to be over what is not entitled so to obtain or alter. With this word entitled, doing some work, but unfortunately without definition, and which work the majority is primarily going to ignore. 
Entitle means to give a title right or claim to something, the majority says. The parties agree that Van Buren had been given the right to acquire license plate information in broad strokes, that he was entitled to obtain it from the law enforcement computer database. But was Van Buren entitled so to obtain the license plate information as the statute requires? He, the defendant here, Van Buren, notes that the so word as used in the statute serves as a term of reference that recalls the same manner as has been stated or the way or manner described. Black's Law Dictionary being as useful as always. And the only manner of obtaining information already stated in the definitional provision is via a computer one is otherwise authorized to access. Putting it together, the defendant here, Van Buren, contends that the disputed phrase is not entitled so to obtain plainly refers to information one is not allowed to obtain by using a computer that he is authorized to access. Does it sound like we're spinning in circles? Because yes, it undoubtedly means that. The question is whether entitled means something different than authorized, right? This definition implies that it does. It says you access a computer with authorization. You use that authorized access to obtain or alter information that the accessor is not entitled so to obtain or alter what he winds up saying here. And I apologize for all of this phraseology. There's no better way to explain all of this is Van Buren is arguing that entitlement is not entitled. So to obtain refers to other prohibited areas of a computer that is otherwise entitled to access that this phrase here is designed to establish a new federal crime for accessing restricted files, restricted databases, restricted folders from a computer that you otherwise have the password to. And that court, the majority, spoiler alert, is ultimately going to agree with him that this exceeds authorized access doesn't mean you used it in violation of a department policy, although it might, we'll talk about that. It instead means that exceeds authorized access is other prohibited parts that would require additional access. Now, I promised you we'd go and talk about this definition of computer again. This is one of the ways that I find this particular thinking faulty and the dissent doesn't raise it, but we can do it here in virtual legality. If you look at the actual definition of computer, which is what's being accessed here, a computer includes what we think of a data processing device. It also includes data storage facilities or communication facilities directly related to or operating in conjunction with such device. Sure, hard drives on the outside, but hard drives on the inside, databases in general. So when you actually are looking at this definition in and of itself, it would seem to imply that the language of the statute already covers accessing prohibited file folders when you intentionally access a computer, which again includes data components of that computer without authorization. Exceeding authorized access then doesn't seem to mean what the majority thinks it means, but we'll get back to that and we'll see exactly how they try to defend themselves against the dissent. The government agrees that the statute uses so in the words term of reference sense. It's a good thing they do because there's no other use for the word so, but it argues that so sweeps more broadly. It reads the phrase is not entitled so to obtain to refer to information when was not allowed to obtain in the particular manner or circumstances in which they obtained it. They're trying to give power to exceeds authorized access means that, yes, you had authorized access through passwords, but you exceeded the rights that you had under the policies that you agreed to with that password. If you got a contract that says, I'll only use the password to look up license plates for speeders. If you try to use it to give a license plate to somebody else that has offered you $5,000, then you've exceeded that access, even though you were authorized to access the computer. That's the government's argument. I really do think that that's the better plain reading of even the definitions that this statute proposes, but the majority rejects it. Why do they reject it? Well, we proceed a little bit further. It says the government ignores the definition's instruction that such manner or circumstance already will have been stated, asserted, or described. Van Buren's account of so, namely that so references the previously stated manner or circumstance, is more plausible than the government's. So we go and we look at this and we say, okay, Van Buren says that the not entitled so to obtain refers to the authorization and the authorization only can apply to what I was authorized to do. So if I was authorized to get license plates overall, this doesn't actually affect me. I didn't exceed authorized access, even though there was a separate component, this policy that said I wasn't allowed to do that. The dissent, which we will see further, says, no, 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 entitled means something more than the passwords. That's why all this statutory language exists. And entitlement relates to the permissions that you have. The majority essentially says, nope, 
The phrase is not entitled so to obtain is best read to refer to information that a person is not entitled to obtain by using a computer that he is authorized to access. By contrast, the government insists so makes a valuable contribution if it incorporates all of the circumstances that might qualify a person's right to obtain information, like, oh, I don't know, contracts, policies, other things that would change the rights that you have to the use of something like a password or other kind of indicia of authorization. While the dissent accepts Van Buren's definition of so, it would arrive at the government's result by way of the word entitled. One is entitled to do something. The dissent contends only when proper grounds are in place. The dissent contends here is a nice little snide remark in terms of court documents like this. Yes, one is entitled to do something only when the proper grounds are in place is really not a contentious assertion, but the dissent contends it because it's important that the majority knocks this out. This reading, like the government's, would extend the statute's reach to any circumstance-based limit appearing anywhere. The dissent's approach to the word entitled fares fine in the abstract, but poorly in context. The statute does not refer to information that the accessor is not entitled to obtain. It refers to information that the accessor is not entitled so to obtain. The word entitled then does not stand alone, inviting the reader to consider the full scope of the accessor's entitlement to information, doesn't it? Doesn't it though? The modifying phrase so to obtain directs the reader to consider a specific limitation on the accessor's entitlement, his entitlement to obtain the information in the manner previously stated. And if you're not understanding this, understand that while I understand it to some extent, I don't fully understand it because they're just spinning wheels here. Entitled is different than access. Exceeds authorized access is designed to hit something extra with what is entitlement. So to obtain refers to the use of the access to get the information. And this use of access concept is completely obliterated out of the entire discussion from the majority or the dissent, right? Did this person use the authorized access to get the license plates? Absolutely they did. So that's the way they obtained it with authorized access. The question is whether they were entitled to do so. The dissent says, no, we have to talk about entitlements like policies and contracts. The majority says, no, except when they don't. We'll get there. When a statute includes an explicit definition of a term, we must follow that definition, even if it varies from a term's ordinary meaning. This is in response to the dissent saying, you have to read this like it reads and say, when we're talking about exceeding authorized access, a normal person would say, well, he was authorized to use it for law enforcement purposes. He used it for a different purpose. That's exceeding authorized access. And they say, well, no, we've got a defined term here. And the dissent winds up saying the defined term doesn't take away from an ordinary reading of the statute. Is not entitled to so obtain or alter means I wasn't entitled by virtue of the contracts I've entered into, the policies I've agreed to, or anything else, to actually go and get something for the guy that wants the stripper's license plate for $5,000. And that doesn't change anything from the majority's perspective. Oh, no, we have to use the definition. This is, by the way, Amy Coney Barrett, in case you wind up thinking that this is just, oh, Trump justices or uh, Republican justices, that is not at all the split of the court. We're going to talk about that last. This is a very unusual split. Now we're going to get into a little bit more specifics here. First, an individual violates the provision when he accesses a computer without authorization. Second, an individual violates the provision when he exceeds authorized access by accessing a computer with authorization and then obtaining information he is not entitled so to obtain. The defendant says, I want to build this into a harmonious whole that we can understand what Congress was intending here. Here's what the majority says. Start with Van Buren's view. The without authorization clause, Van Buren contends, protects computers themselves by targeting so-called outside hackers, those who access a computer without any permission at all. Okay, I think we can all understand that, right? You don't have access to a computer, you break into it, you steal information. Seems pretty clear that that's what the first provision is entitled to hit, right? That they, they want to hit that if you don't have access and you steal information, that is a federal crime. Intentionally access a computer without authorization. All right, we got you. Now the second part. Van Buren then reads the exceeds authorized access clause to provide complementary protection for only certain information within computers. It does so, Van Buren asserts, by targeting so-called inside hackers, those who access a computer with permission, but then exceed the parameters of authorized access by entering an area of the computer to which that authorization does not extend. You see here a reference to the Second Circuit, and you see the circuit split with the readings of these particular definitions. Of course, that doesn't work with the definitions of computer. It doesn't work with the definitions of authorized in my view, but hey, I'm a circuit split to the Supreme Court now, so that's okay. And here is where we get into real, real trouble. I promised you a mess, right? You've understood everything that the majority has said, probably better than me at this point, because you're a virtual legality watcher and you know where your towel is. And yet 
the majority just can't leave well enough alone. They've said basically that this is going to apply only to protected folders. It's going to be a technological concept. Under Van Buren's reading, liability under both clauses stems from a gates up or down inquiry, which is, as far as I know, a brand new term of art incorporated by the Supreme Court here. One either can or cannot access a computer system, and one either can or cannot access certain areas within that system. It's done. If you can access license plates, you can use license plates. You're not a federal criminal for using them, even for any reason outside of the policies that have given you the rights, right? We understand what Justice Barrett is saying here, or do we? Let's look at footnote number eight. For present purposes, we need not address whether this inquiry turns only on technological limitations on access, or instead also looks to limits contained in contracts or policies. I'm sorry, what, Justice Barrett? The entirety of your opinion is based on the premise that the police department's policy prohibiting this use does not apply. It doesn't change the authorization. It doesn't change the entitlement. And yet you go out of your way after saying all of this about all of this in footnote eight to say, um, we're actually not making a determination here about whether your authorization slash entitlement can be affected uh, by policies. Aren't you? What does that even mean? <laughs> Can a police department have a policy that says you're prohibited from using this for personal use? What, what does that look like? What would make it work for you, Supreme Court, under this gates up or gates down inquiry? You can't access license plate information for personal use, period. He violated it. Everybody agrees. And you say he is nonetheless not wrong to fight this because it doesn't exceed authorized access because he had access to the computer with the overall password and we're not talking about contracts or policies here. What are you even saying, Supreme Court? I have no idea what to do with this, and I doubt many people do. Footnote 8 is an absolute outlier to the rest of the decision. Maybe it will be just tossed in the dustbin of history. Nobody will ever look at it again because there is no way to read this other than saying the police department policy was not substantive enough to qualify this individual's authorization. And what is a police department to do? I don't know. What is an employer to do, a corporation to do? Because all of this affects all of that which at the end of the day is why this case is important and why ultimately I think the Supreme Court made the decision that it did. We'll get to that. As discussed, the government reads the exceeds authorized access clause to incorporate purpose-based limits contained in contracts and workplace policies. Oh, wait, no, you just said you're not making this decision. What are you doing, Justice Barrett? Yet the government does not read such limits into the threshold question whether someone uses a computer without authorization, even though similar purpose restrictions like a rule against personal use often govern one's right to access a computer in the first place. Do they? Have you ever been in an employer that said you can't actually use your password to get on a computer for personal use? Most of these I've seen uh, have indicated that you can have access to the computer, you use a password, you don't share the password with other people, and the computer is not to be done for X, Y, or Z. Very similar to at least how the police department policy is described in this case. Here, the justice appears to be suggesting that there are policies that say you can't even get on your computer, you can't use this password uh, for personal use. And I don't know that any of them are written that way, really. Maybe they will be. Now, after a court decision like this, it'll just make it tougher for uh, individuals without a legal background to read. But hey, them's the breaks, right? So they're saying we aren't going to talk about workplace policies or contracts, except the government didn't even bring that up with respect to authorization. They're only talking about it with respect to entitlement. I got you, I guess. And yes, if you've come to the conclusion that I don't like Justice Barrett's writing style, you are accurate. Uh, now, she's pretty new to the Supreme Court, might get better, might get worse. I don't know. I don't judge these folks solely on their writing style, but on their legal decision making. And I don't much care for this decision, but the writing is also all over the place. The government's position has another structural problem, she contends. Recall that violating 1030A2, the provision under which Van Buren was charged, also gives rise to civil liability. Provisions defining damage in law specify what a plaintiff in a civil suit can recover. Damage, the statute provides, means any impairment to the integrity or availability of data, a program, a system, or information. The term loss likewise relates to costs caused by harm to computer data, program systems, or information services. The term's definitions are ill-fitted, however, to remediating misuse of sensitive information that employees may permissibly access using their computers. Yes, that's undoubtedly the case. 
But it makes no sense to this lawyer who notes that a lot of federal and state statutes have damage provisions that sometimes don't apply in given facts or circumstances. And yet the law doesn't just prohibit obtaining or hurting what's actually obtained through exceeding authorized access, but just getting the information at all from any protected computer. We go back to the definitions. It includes just accessing it. So yeah, that was never going to fit well with a damage or loss concept, but hey, if it doesn't get stolen or altered, it doesn't have damages or losses in the same respect. That doesn't change the reading of the statute. So we have here a majority that is rightly defending its position and doing it from every angle that it can find, but with some fairly stupid arguments. You made a reading, you don't need to defend it in this particular fashion. And again, my opinion. To top it all off, and here is where the practical, the real politic rubber hits the road. The government's interpretation of the statute would attach criminal penalties to a breathtaking amount of commonplace computer activity. If the exceeds authorized access clause criminalizes every violation of a computer use policy, then millions of otherwise law-abiding citizens are criminals. Take the workplace. Employers commonly state that computers and electronic devices can be used only for business purposes. So on the government's reading of the statute, an employee who sends a personal email or reads the news using her work computer has violated the CFAA. Maybe. The dissent will bring up a number of arguments to suggest that isn't exactly how broadly the act actually reaches. I don't know if I buy the dissent's arguments here, but this is what this policy fight is about. This is why computer lawyers and others have been following it so closely is this notion of if you give a Netflix password to somebody and you say you can only use it to access the kids panel and they access more than the kids panel, are they a federal criminal? Because you put an entitlement and a consent component on giving that authorized access, which Netflix would dispute because you're not allowed to trade your passwords that way, but we'll ignore for just a second. Are you a federal criminal? Or heck, if you've got a password and you share it around, are you a federal criminal to Netflix? Because you've given other access that wasn't permitted to be shared by Netflix. And you have all of these around everything, right? We all work with computers. We all work with computers that are connected to the internet. We're all constantly agreeing to end user license agreements with all sorts of limits that nobody reads and nobody knows unless you're in virtual legality. And so this court says, if you read this statute the way the government says, if you read it the way that they contend, you've got a real problem here because exceeds authorized access, incorporates contracts, incorporates policies, incorporates all this extra stuff. And everybody everywhere is probably a federal criminal. Now the dissent, which we will see, will ultimately wind up saying, well, everybody's a federal criminal anyway, and it's not our job to change the law here. Congress is silly. Congress is often silly. And they made something that arguably makes a whole lot of people into federal criminals because if you violate an end user license agreement or terms of service or a contract, then you might well be exceeding authorized access. Now there are limitations to that. You still have to obtain the information from the computer. You still have to alter it. You still have to actually access it in a fashion that would meet up with these definitions. And the dissent raises all of those things. But ultimately, when you look at this case, when you look at what the majority's decision is, when you look at the constitution of the six individuals that voted for this, it was a 6-3 decision, you see a certain pragmatism that says, okay, we're gonna fix this for Congress, that a lot of this feels like a reach, that all of that language BS that we talked about in the middle of this video is trying to get to the point where you say, we don't want this to apply to contracts and policies while still putting in footnote eight to make everybody everywhere confused about what the heck you just ruled. The dissent takes a different tact. And if you're familiar with virtual legality, you might expect what tact it is to take to resonate a little bit better with me. And it's a more textualist approach. We'll see it in just a second. First, I wanted to summarize what the majority held just so that you have it in the back of your head. In sum, an individual exceeds authorized access when he accesses a computer with authorization, but then obtains information located in particular areas of the computer that are off limits to him. Van Buren accordingly did not exceed authorized access to the database as the CFAA defines the phrase, even though he obtained information from the database for an improper purpose. In other words, the court finds that he was still entitled to do so, even though the policies that ostensibly restricted that right were very explicit in that restriction. That's what the Supreme Court decided, and I think it decided it to try to get around all of these policy questions. Now, the dissent says, um, okay, it's not up to us. And they take a different approach that I do think resonates better with a common understanding of what this law purports to do and how generally we should read it. 
You see it's Thomas, Alito, and Roberts, of all people, however, on this side. And unusually, Gorsuch, who is a primarily a textualist jurist, at least in my readings of what he has written in terms of opinions, went with the majority. So there's probably a textualist argument you can make stronger than I am that Gorsuch might say in some speech somewhere. And yet you get this wild split uh, between what we would generally consider the left and the right uh, coming together to make this six vote uh, majority. And then Thomas Alito and Roberts, the kind of Bush justices saying, no, 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 not so fast. Here's Thomas writing the dissent. Both the common law and statutory law have long punished those who exceed the scope of consent when using property that belongs to others. Indeed, they do. A valet, for example, may take possession of a person's car to park it, but he cannot take it for a joyride, unless you're in Ferris Bueller's day off. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act extends that principle to computers and information. Now, this is a fundamental fight between the dissent and the majority. The dissent is going to say, look, we have property law, and the CFAA was an attempt by Congress to take property law concepts, this particular concept that you have trespass on the initial instance, you're just, you've got a fence up, looters will be shot, whatever it is. And if you violate that line, you're trespass, you're in violation of law, or you have trespass for use where you say, you can come onto my property to do X, Y, or Z, but if you do A, B, or C, that becomes trespass. You are allowed inside a store to go shop there, but if you say something you don't like, if you don't wear a mask and the person wants you to wear a mask, then you are trespassing for not complying with their rules. They have a consent right to the property that they maintain access to. The dissent's argument is that the CFAA was nothing more than encapsulation of that in statute versus the majority says, no, 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 it was designed to do something different from that. The dissent continues, the question here is straightforward. Would an ordinary reader of the English language understand Van Buren to have exceeded authorized access to the database when he used it under circumstances that were expressly forbidden? In my view, the answer is yes. The necessary precondition that permitted him to obtain that data was absent. He was not entitled to access it. A person is entitled to do something only if he has a right to do it. Everyone agrees that he obtained it for personal gain, not for a valid law enforcement purpose. And without a valid law enforcement purpose, he was forbidden to use the computer to obtain that information. Foremost, interpretation is contrary to the plain meaning of the text, the interpretation of the majority. Entitlements are necessary circumstance dependent. A person is entitled to do something only when proper grounds or facts are in place. We saw the majority try to dispel this particular argument. A few real world scenarios illustrate the point. An employee who is entitled to pull the alarm in the event of a fire is not entitled to pull it for some other purpose such as to delay a meeting for which he is unprepared. Many the plot lines of 1980s sitcoms relate to the old fire alarm pole. And to take an example closer to the statute, an employee of a car rental company may be entitled to access a computer showing the GPS location history of a rental car and use such access to locate the car if it is reported stolen. But it would be unnatural to say he is entitled to use such access to stalk his ex-girlfriend. The majority offers no real response. I tend to agree that they don't. If a person is not entitled to obtain information at all, it necessarily follows that he has no right to access the information by using a computer. That's the word so is tied to that use of the computer. Thomas here says, hey, that so doesn't matter if the entitlement never accrues at all. And I tend to agree that that's the better reading of what Congress put in place. As the second restatement of torts explains, A conditional or restricted consent to enter land creates a privilege to do so only insofar as the conditional restriction is complied with. What is true for land is also true in the computer context. If a company grants permission to an employee to use a computer for a specific purpose, the employee has no authority to use it for other purposes. And again, I tend to agree. And he dispels or tries to dispel the majority's argument that common law shouldn't be used, that this was a different statute intended for something different by saying Congress did not enact this law to eliminate the established principle that entitlements to use property are circumstance specific, but instead to eliminate the deprivation and physical entry requirements. And we've seen Congress try to do these things. You know, we've talked about uh, publicly accessible spaces and the Civil Rights Act and things in virtual legality and how they are poor fits for websites and digital infrastructure and things like Facebook or Twitter because they all contemplate physical access to a space. And yet the spirit of the law probably should be addressed in the digital landscape. It doesn't as of yet. And Congress has often in the past looked at something like that and said, oh, we should update it for the current. And the dissent is arguing that that's what happened here. Computers became popular. They said, oh, computers need to be treated like just any other kind of property. They tried to do that. And now the court here in 2021 says, nah, they were trying to do something else. The dissent also argues that their reading reads the two phrases more harmoniously than the majority. 
I agree that the two clauses should be read harmoniously, but there is no reason to believe that if the gates are up in a single instance, which is talking about that author, uh, the authorization, the password concept, then they must remain up indefinitely. An employee who works with sensitive defense information may generally have authority to log into his employer, uh, employer's issued laptop while away from the office, but if his employer instructs him not to log in while on a trip to a country where network connections cannot be trusted, he accesses the computer without authorization if he logs in anyway. That these are conditional. Yes, you have a password to do this kind of thing, but we have restrictions. Don't access it from a country that has suspect network connections. In fact, my reading, argues Justice Thomas, harmonizes both clauses with established concepts of property law. Property law generally protects against both unlawful entry and unlawful use after entry. Were there any remaining doubt about which interpretation better fits the statute, the defined term actually settles it. When a definition is susceptible of more than one reading, the one that best matches the plain meaning of the defined term ordinarily controls. And he gives a few quotes to that effect. So if you can read this definition that is at the heart of all this for exceeds authorized access to mean what it seems to sound like in this section too, the dissent argues properly that you should read that definition to mean what it sounds like up here. And I do think that the majority takes a fairly tortured approach to the word so and entitled to get to this concept that what that proposition actually is, is other unauthorized sections of an existing computer. The majority ends with policy arguments. It suggests they are not needed, yet it stresses them at length. Regardless, the majority's reliance on these policy arguments is an error. Now this paragraph, which I like, dissents are always fun, uh, is as close as you really get, generally speaking, not always, uh, to justices telling each other that they are lying. The majority ends with policy arguments. It suggests they are not needed, yet it stresses them at length. That's an oddly long section about how this policy is super important, and yet you don't need it to arrive at this decision. Uh, it says, yeah, uh, we get you. And as I said, as my section of this video, the policy does appear to have driven a lot of this. The majority's argument also proves too much. Much of the federal code criminalizes common activity. Absent aggravating factors, the penalty for violating this act is a misdemeanor. The number of federal laws and regulations that trigger criminal penalties may be as high as several hundred thousand. It is understandable to be uncomfortable with so much conduct being criminalized, but that discomfort does not give us the authority to alter statutes. The text makes one thing clear. Using a police database to obtain information in circumstances where that use is expressly forbidden is a crime, and I respectfully dissent. So, you know, here we get the difference of legislating from the bench, the real politic kind of justice approach, and the textualists, let the cards fall where they may. Uh, and if you've been in virtual legality for a while, you know, I feel pretty strongly that the judiciary should basically be reading these things and then interpreting them and then not legislating from the bench, not fixing these things. We've talked about Roberts and his tendency to do that at length uh, with respect to statutes of this type and others. Uh, and yet I am certainly understanding of wanting to say this is ridiculous. Reading this as Congress passed it, reading it by the definitions as I do here in virtual legality is something that demands correction. That there are instances that the majority properly identifies as being 100% ridiculous to be a federal crime. That you could actually potentially have a federal lawsuit about someone using their work computer to send a personal email if the handbook prohibits it. That that is a valid reading of this statute in certain circumstances, and that is absurd. But also, simultaneously, that it's not the court's job to fix that, other than perhaps with a decision like this one could have been that says, this is utterly ridiculous. Congress, get off your butts and change this so that it doesn't criminalize hundreds of thousands, if not millions of American citizens. That that's the role of the court, not to change things for the benefit of con Congress, to legislate from the bench, to make these policy determinations when they're not elected, they're unelected officials, they're not a democratic institution, and the policy precepts properly fall in the hands of Congress and the presidency. So at the end of the day, if you take nothing else away from this, you should take that the Supreme Court has said, taking $5,000 to use a police database uh, for purposes to which the policy of the police department specifically prohibit, not illegal, not unauthorized access under the federal statute. Maybe you can get them for something like digital trespass in the actual jurisdiction in question. But the Supreme Court says that this act does not cover that based on a fairly tortured reading and probably a policy-based bent to make sure that 
not using Netflix for the way it was intended isn't a federal crime. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoy conversations about the business and law of computers, technology, pop culture, video games, and more, please consider supporting the channel. We're having a ton of conversations on these topics and more here. We've got a Patreon. We've got a Streamlabs. We've got a store that you can buy things from or just subscribing to the channel, upvotes, downvotes, sharing us with friends, telling your friends that we exist, putting us on forums and other places that we can't get to on the internet. Every little bit is helpful. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.